So, uh, welcome to HashiConf. My name is Clint Shryock. I am a Terraform engineer, and the past few weeks I've had the, uh, have a lot of fun working on uh, Nomad. So, if you have any questions about those things, you can find me later this afternoon. Uh, so, I'm here with the privilege of introducing our first speaker today, Nikal Vaze. Uh, he's from Electric Cloud, and he's here to talk about using Vagrant, Terraform, and Docker to streamline your development and demo environments. He's going to talk about how they've come to discover these tools, um, how they solve business problems, and then just general tips about uh, evangelizing these products in your own company. So please welcome Nikhail. All right. Hey, everyone. Uh, you know, um, my name is Nikhil Vaze, and I work at Electric Cloud. And um, so Clint did a great job of introducing me. But here's my GitHub and Twitter handle. Um, and Really, what I want to kind of, if you take a few things away from the talk, I want to say I love these tools. Uh, I've never been more excited to be a software engineer, you know? And uh, I'd like to explain what, what were the business reasons why we looked for solutions and ended up with these, along with um, if, you've, if, these, if these problems resonate, how should you sort of evangelize or try to seek consensus on one of these tools within your organization. So I'm not going to go really uh, technical, and um, I'm, I'm going to show some code, but this, my talk is more going to be about um, kind of use cases and how I kind of evangelized. So I have two slides about Electric Cloud, uh, because what I was saying before was we had um, how did, I, how did we use Terraform, Docker, and Vagrant? I just need to set up the stage a little bit for what, who we are, what we do, and what type of problems we solve. So um, Electric Cloud has two products. Uh, I work on the Electric Flow side. It is you know, kind of end-to-end -end automation from checking in all the way to deployment to production. The key things, though, are it's tip, it's, we have typically large enterprises that um, seek us out, and it's a installed product. So it's not a SaaS service. We're not a consulting service. Um, it's just you know, typical enterprise sales, POCs, um, data centers. And nowadays, we're seeing a little bit um, more people kind of going into the cloud. Um, so for, but for now, it's, uh, it is very much kind of installed software. And OK, and we, right. Uh, what I spend a lot of my time on is working on our integrations. Um, so, you know, from checkout all the way to production, say Amazon, there's like a whole host of tools that you need. And as a result, we actually use Vagrant and Docker quite a bit um, to simulate and keep track of different versions of Git or, um, you know, d does our MySQL uh, integration work with different versions of MySQL? Um, but I'll be talking, giving, I won't quite be talking about that today. Um, I'll be more so talking about how we first landed on Vagrant, and I call these sort of the dark days. Um, so, you know, in 2010, we were in one room, and all the engineers were on the same schedule. You know, we, um, we were kind of, we were early, it was early days. And as a result, a lot of our processes were very, you know, very informal and very wiki driven. So. Throughout the talk, I think I'll be kind of saying, you know, we started off with Wiki, and as time is going on, we're going more and more to code. Um, so, you know, show of hands, um, you know, who has been burned by a Wiki document? Right, you know, so if you haven't put your hand up, um, <laughs> you know, I don't quite believe you. Um, and I'll just give you kind of the, hey, how, did, how was I burned, right? So in 2010, um, this is how we started a code review. This is, this is honest truth. I took this screenshot from our wiki. And, um, you know, it's, it's just, there's like, go out, you know, uh, there's like, uh, you know, your project will load and be ready when, you, when you're coming back from coffee. There's some, you know, just, it, it's, you don't get confidence that you will be able to successfully launch a code review. Um, so, how we solve this is a separate problem, right? But it, this was the culture that we had that, hey, whenever there is a problem, whenever you need to convey something to another team member, go to the wiki. And as the years went on, um, it started to show some strain. So, you know, we were lucky enough to grow 
Um, I'd say the biggest thing is we got geographically distributed all around the world. And our first, you know, we thought we were very well suited for this growth because we were like, hey, we've been really diligent about the wiki, right? New employees, great. Here's the wiki page, go read it, right? Uh, you're gonna be super productive. So this is what happened, right? Like after um, you say, I, hey, it's on the wiki, things diverge, things change, you know, it's incomplete. Um, and because it, you're geographically distributed, because these are new team members, um, it really slows down the process and, or, I mean, slows down everyone's productivity. And it hurts kind of, yeah, just it hurts productivity. Um, so, so confronted with this, our first response was like, okay, whoops, sorry, we should have been more diligent about updating the wiki. I'll just go ahead and update the wiki, right? So we update the wiki. Now we come down to this, and this is now starting to get more relevant to kind of the rest of the talk, which is, okay, so how should, you know, this is like 2012-ish, um, how should we deal with the cloud? Uh, what does it mean to spin something on up on EC2? And we said, okay, we are going to put this wiki page, right? And we put the credentials, and you know, one through eight, right? Here is the, <laughs> here are what to put for like the, the GUI. Uh, when the GUI asks you questions, here's what to put. You know, same thing. Um, things became out of date, uh, just the same problems. And it was clear to us, you know, that the wiki is not, is not the solution. Um, so I've kind of harped on these, you know, wiki out of date. Our, as the years went on as well, and as cloud has, you know, become more and more popular, the complexity of our software also increase. So it's not just one monolith that you deploy to EC2, but now we have Zookeeper and different pieces. So it's like we have 10 wiki documents saying how, how should you get your software off there. And the last one is kind of the killer. Um, you know, we just, we were not spending time on product dev, we were spending time on, you know, triaging um, and everything like, and like that. So, you know, this is kind of an apt, this is how I feel um, after you kind of waste a day between, um, you know, you and another person where it, it's not a product issue, but it's just a configuration problem. Um, so in 2013, right, we just asked ourselves, there has to be a better way. Uh, perhaps this is too late, you know, perhaps members of the audience saw the light sooner. Uh, but for us, we were thinking, how can we get, how can we move away from the wiki um, how can something be reconstructed, shared, local teach, tester, and then how can we use that same thing in our CI? And that, so I'm setting the stage for kind of our adoption of Vagrant, but I'll take a small kind of side note, which is kind of like, you know, culturally, or what you may find is that uh, when you get to this point of growth, what's worked for you so far in the past um, may not work in the future. and uh, these are all kind of, for, for us at least, these were new sites, new people. Um, and it, when they ran into a problem, there wasn't that sort of, hey, we've been in a pressure cooker before, we've solved those production problems, um, I believe this person 100%, right? It was like, oh, okay, who is this person? What are their capabilities? Are they telling the truth, you know? Um, and that's, that's tough because um, because you don't have that and because they're running into problems, it slow, it's kind of like both sides get a little bit um, maybe annoyed. So, and it's very, very um, natural to be a little bit defensive, to be like, hey, we have been successful, we've gr grown year over year, this has worked for us so far. So, you know, how, are we, how did we adopt better tooling? And so this is just a quote from Jez Humble, right? Um, if it hurts, you know, do it more often. Um, and what we found was that wiki, those wiki docs not only were out of date, but it was so tedious to follow them that you would hang on to these environments. Um, you would want to do them, you wouldn't really, you would shy away from updating uh, or trying, you know, spawning new environments. So these are the questions we asked. Um, and so now, yeah, so welcome to, you know, welcome to Vagrant. And it's funny, one of the audience members came by uh, right before the talk and was like, oh, so are you gonna talk about Nomad and Auto? Um, no, I had no idea uh, about those products. I'll speed through these because um, I, th well, actually as a hand, uh, do we have Vagrant users? Like, is everyone familiar with, with Vagrant? Okay, okay, okay. So I'm just gonna blaze. So 
I will go fast through this, but this is how I would explain it to someone who's new to Vagrant, and I, I still run into people um, you know, who are new to Vagrant. So I say, hey, if you look at VirtualBox, these commands are kind of uh, analogous to a lot of the VirtualBox GUI. Um, Vagrant up is the play button. Vagrant SSH is how you get into the Vagrant uh, box, and you can now have command line access. It's a Linux, um, it's, it's a shell. Once you exit Vagrant, if you want to see how, what's, um, what's running, you say status. You know, that's like the equivalent of all, a list of all your VMs in VirtualBox. There's also a global status, but you know, same, sort of same concept. You destroy it, you know, destroy dot dash F. Um, so you're just saying, you know, hey, you just described VMs. What, I don't see where you're going with this. And the biggest thing was the Vagrant file. And I know kind of Mitchell talked about how um, it has, you know, it's fossilization, he said. Um, but f at that time, that's what we wanted. That's what we needed. And um, so over here, I talk about uh, how I would go through this is just um, singing the praises of the Vagrant file, going through, saying, hey, um, this is, you know, you Vagrant up, and this is the definition. You get it. Here are some knobs you can turn, which is memory, CPU. Um, so I'm going, I'm going fast because I, I think this is review for, for mostly everyone in the audience. And now this is the piece. Um, it is how to install our software once that Vagrant VM has started. And this is sort of what I would say we've moved away from Wiki and moved towards this. So once you, once you we, we check this in, once you Vagrant up, um, you get an environment or you get your development environment and we keep it up to date. So I'm just saying, hey, these are different pieces. Um, this is how it looks on disk. What we do is we, for now, we put our installer right next to our Vagrant file. Uh, we only check in our Vagrant file. We, um, we retrieve our, our installer and then we do a Vagrant up. And so, um, so if the audience was a little bit, if you guys, or if everyone was a little bit less familiar with Vagrant, I'd go sort of step by step. But for us, what we saw really was now suddenly everyone was on the same page. Um, and the, docu you know, the documentation's in the Vagrant file. Shell is very natural, like shell scripts. People are very used to that. Um, so they can embrace it. So if there is a deviation, anyone can go into the Vagrant file, make a change, see if it works, and submit it. Versus, I uh, suppose you could make the same argument about the wiki, but um, that anyone could, in theory, modify the wiki. But in practice, we saw only a few people um, modifying the wiki when it was there. And I guess the key thing is this is, this would, this is used in automated testing, so it's kept fresh um, because otherwise builds or you know, the nightly build would fail. Um, I'll skip you know, how, to get, how do I get Vagrant. Um, so the tips, I would say, um, in, in kind of our, with our experience, you know, your, <laughs> your relationship with VirtualBox will be love-hate. And particularly if you're on Windows, I'd say, um, there are still a lot of bugs, and I don't think it's really on Vagrant. I think it's just, you know, all Vagrant is doing is wrapping VBox manage, and I've just run into a lot of, a lot of issues where, you know, they're private networks, and over time, the private, uh, or, VirtualBox can't see the same private network on Windows, then it fails to attach um, that network to the VM. And you know, so luckily it's open source. Uh, you can add print and put, you can add print state, or you can add put statements um, to debug this. But for the most part, it's been pretty helpful. But you will, if you are promoting this within your organization, um, you should feel comfortable with kind of, with doing the following. Um, yeah, so this is the other, so sorry, my notes here are on my phone. I just need to kind of go forward, okay. Uh, in terms of advocating technology, you know, one of the things that I saw a lot when I suggested, or me or other members of the team suggested a technology was sort of, what is the value? And I think HashiCorp does a really good job. Each, um, each product that they launch that I, that I one thing I admire is they always have the use cases comparison to the, to the, um, to the existing tools, like the motivations for why, um, why this tool has been introduced. So similarly, if you are adopting or promoting a technology, um, I would say look for the business problem first, right? And then say, hey, I think this tool can solve this real problem that we're having. 
Um, and there's, so there's a business fable that I heard once, which is, um, let's see, I wrote it down. You know, in a bacon and egg breakfast, what's the difference between the chicken and the pig? You know, and the answer is, you know, the chicken is involved, but the pig is committed. Um, what I would say is, if you are um, really advocating for a technology, then, you know, for lack of better words, like you are the pig, right? You are committed. And this is some, you should feel comfortable doing these types of things. Um, and this, so this was, these are real emails pulled out um, that I got, I don't know, maybe a year later or actually, I did not get them directly, right? They were sent to an alias and I happened to read them. So um, they basically, you know, the too long didn't read is basically like, I was skeptical at first, now it's worked, now I use, uh, it works really well, now I use it every day. Um, and in fact, the middle one was like, oh, someone actually went forward and, you know, I was, I'm, I like Ubuntu Debian, this person like CentOS, Red Hat, um, so they started kind of like a Red Hat contingent or like a CentOS contingent. So it's like that's a healthy sign where people are liking it, but tailoring it to suit their needs. So, um, you know, so this was 2012, um, so I, that was Vagrant, and um, I'll go through kind of the next kind of situation that was, um, I, I say it's multi-app server, multi-host deployments, I think this makes it sound more complicated than it really is. Um, we, were, we, we ran into a situation where we needed to create a demo environment of Wildfly. So Wildfly is an open source um, application server. It was spawned, I believe, from JBoss, or it's like the open source version of JBoss. And it is a little, there, there are different modes. There's you know, standalone and domain. Um, and domain is a little bit complicated, um, not, not terribly complex, but in order to set up a real, um, a real kind of domain and, host, domain and host controllers, you have to do a little bit of configuration work. And we found ourselves that you know, we, are trying to, we are in a situation where we need to produce a lot of these environments. Um, and Vagrant, we, while we could have done Vagrant, um, not everyone has a, a very powerful laptop. And what, if, what happens if we need to switch these machines, you know, from three to six, you know, actually, as Mitchell said in the kind of in the keynote, there's like a, there's an upper bound for how many VMs you can, you can create uh, on, one, on one laptop. So this is what we were trying to do. So again, kind of the business problem. Um, we needed to set up and do an application deployment and in Wildfly uh, domain mode specifically, um, they, there's one Wildfly kind of administration server. You deploy to it, it holds the, what are the server groups? Um, it handles doing the distribution of files. Um, but we also needed to show that, oh, hey, you know, my shiny little app, it, it shows up on host one, but not host two when I say so. So we were, sh we were demoing, um, you know, just a, an application deployment. Um, and this was the kind of network topology. Um, so again, you know, very similar requirements to the environment. Um, we'd like it to be definition based. We want it to be, you know, oh my God, we did not want to do wiki, right? Like we learned at that point that putting it on the wiki for, for not having our, like arbitrary people, uh, okay, employees, but cross-functional, right? Um, doc, Q, uh, QA, sales, try to follow a wiki for this is just, it's a recipe for disaster. Um, so, you know, here are our requirements and as luck would have it, Terraform was there. So, you know, Terraform made by HashiCorp, it's open source. Here are kind of the key, you know, plan, apply, destroy, uh, you know, Vagrant up, Vagrant destroy dash F and Terraform plan shows you a little bit, um, it's like a dry run where it shows you what it is about to do before it does it. So it's a little dry run sanity check. Um, okay, so I, I, I did this, um, I'm going to switch to some code if anyone is interested. Um, here's how you, how you get it, but at this point I'll, I'll show you kind of the code. So, okay, great. Um, there are just three files, right? And this, what I'm showing you is what, what, actually the real working example of how we 
got those three Wildfly servers um, hooked up with Terraform. So these files are, are, pretty, um, are pretty standard. I think the documentation for Terraform has increased a lot, and there are actually a lot of people who have um, wrote, who have given really comprehensive examples that I'll point to later in the slides. Um, so kind of in five seconds, you know, this is a file, you know, you put your AWS access key, uh, you put your access key secret key, this is just a place where you define your, your variables um, that you want to use within your main, like where your, your main logic is. And so what I, I, for us, I put this really long um, one file called wildfly.tf. What I've seen other people do is actually split these out. Um, that's probably a better practice, but this was my first time with Terraform, so I, so I stuck with it here. Um, and so you can see I made, you know, I've tried to define things in, in one file, where to get JBoss, what the version is. Uh, I did not do a 100% job because I have, you know, some information has leaked <laughs> inside my wildfire.tf. Ideally, this should be pulled up. But a lot of these pieces um, are parameterized. So one of our requirements was each person should be able to run this Terraform script and get their own environment. How do you do that? Um, how do you, so not only how do you do that, but on the AWS EC2 side, um, for administrators or, or operators or the IT team, how do they know who spawned up what? How do you make sure you don't conflict? Um, I, I guess it's less so the conflict, more so um, how do you identify from AWS side who, what belongs to whom? And I, so for that, I really like, um, kind of the, the, this pattern over here, which is, you know, you take an input, so a user, um, the user who wants to run these scripts passes a command line, um, passes a variable at, on the command line, and that then gets um, wired into the definition. So that's one thing I, I, I liked. Um, what we used here is kind of the SSH provisioner. Um, so the instance spawns up, we SS, or Terraform SSH is in, and um, now you run, you know, commands one, two, three, four. Um, so I've, uh, other people use Cloudident, and um, I, I think that works pretty well as, as well. I think, so there's, yeah, there's this one air pair uh, article that I'm like mentally referring to. I'll have a link to it, to, to it a little bit later. Um, but okay, so over here, you know, this is very similar to, to our Vagrant file or like the shell script portion. Um, so, you know, we're getting wget, we're getting the URL, we're unzipping it. Kind of the biggest, um, the like, the, the complexity here was, or, you know, the complexity um, in quotes is that you have to do a little bit of XML file manipulation. Um, and that is the, in the past, that was the manual units of work that, oh, you SSH to the machine and you pretty much run this command or you run nano, you know, Vim, Nano, Emacs to do this equivalent. Um, so, you know, once, so this is for, I believe this is for domain and then very similar for what should be part of, you know, the, the host, the host controllers. Um, but now, you know, it's, it's all here. Not only do you have the VMs, but you also, or not only do you have the instances, you also have the security groups. You can modify these as you, as you'd like. Um, and you have some output. So after you're done, you get some kind of um, some output that you can action on. Um, so I so now that I've kind of gone through the code, I'll go through. Hey, how does this look? Um, you know, so here's plan. This is hey, what am I about to do? It's a dry run. Um, notice kind of the the uh, parameters we, we you, you can pass to Terraform. Um, a cool thing is the graph of Terraform. Um, Terraform graph pipe to dot, you know, you can see nowhere in that, in that TF file did I say do this action before another. Terraform read, parsed it, generated this graph internally, um, and then gave me a visual representation, I guess, with, with dot. And here we're saying, you know, everything relies on AWS. I need first, I need the security group. Um, first in order, you know, is domain. And once I've got the domain, then I can wire in my two hosts. Um, so that's, that's all it's really saying. So, you know, apply kind of the same thing. You know, uh, there's a command line. You pass, some, um, you pass some variables to it. And when you're done, now it's, um, you know, green, yay, things are working. But it also, this output section over here is configurable. And you can kind of put, tailor it to your own need. So for me, um, 
you know, I just really needed um, where is the domain controller? How do I get to the management console? Um, things like that. And then finally, the actual hosts, hey, um, how do I get to the application that was deployed? OK, I'll go to like, you know, host one, port 8080. Um, right, and here's, so yeah, here's the apply again. Um, when you're done, you know, it's, it's the same Terraform, destroy, everything goes away, um, very similar to, to, to Vagrant destroy. So, you know, to, to review, here were our requirements, right? Um, it should be definition-based, um, should be re reproducible, shareable, you know, each invocation should be tailored to the individual. So I'd say we, we, we were able to get, we were able to achieve all of our, um, all of our requirements and, you know, I could go, I think, I hope this stands sort of, yeah, stands on its own. Um, so, you know, what, so, I, yeah, what problems did it solve? Um, now we no longer had to do those wiki pages for how do you create something on the cloud. Um, things were documented and it, it's, you can kind of see that they're sh it's shareable because everything is within shell. Um, it can go from, from Vagrant to Terraform if you want to do something locally or if you want to do code reuse, it's there. Um, I believe they, Terraform also just recently started supporting Chef. So if you're also you know, into configuration management, um, the same kind of principles apply. Um, you know, I'm harping on the, the documentation is, is as code. Um, you know, that's there. It's version, you can go back into history. Um, but, oops, so that should say each developer can run Terraform <laughs> on their laptop. Um, and the last one is really, what I took out of it was um, you start saving the UI clicks um, in Amazon when it's you know creating the security group or uh, I guess in this case it's yeah it's cre it's creating the security groups. Oops, I, I leaked this next part about the ELB is actually my my third and kind of final use case. Um, so you know Terraform tips or if I if I had to convince someone right um, to why they should use Terraform. You know, it's super easy to, to install. It's a Go, it's written in Go, which means, you know, um, the, it's a directory of executables that have everything that, um, that are statically linked. And the one caution I'd say though is, well, Vagrant um, was, everything was, it was on your laptop and free. Just be careful because Terraform will cost you money um, because, you know, kind of by definition because it's going to the cloud and making, um, making some things. Um, or, Creating, creating and running some things. Um, I would say the syntax, uh, there were definitely times where the syntax got me. Um, if I were to, like, you know, security groups, you have to s specify them as a list. Um, after you find that out, it's, oh, yeah, that makes perfect sense, you know? But at the time, when I first, like, my first memory of Terraform was I just tried to set, like, a straightforward string for the security group, um, and, and it failed, you know? because, well, yeah, because Amazon accepts multiple security groups for, for an instance, and that's what, what Terraform kind of wants. But you'll, there's some syntax like that that um, may not be intuitive, but for the most part, documentation has, has improved. Um, and the last one, I don't know, this is maybe a little bit controversial. Uh, I don't really mean it to be so. I've mostly used it for demo and short-term work. Um, I, I wouldn't use it alone solely in production. It, it like, sort of as they showed on the keynote, um, it is meant to be used in conjunction with something else. Um, and, or, and I hope to kind of fill those in in my, in my, last, um, in my last example. So um, let's see, yeah, okay, cool, right, going right on time. This one, um, so okay, so we talked about Vagrant, we talked about Terraform. Now the kind of like a third use case that we ran into. Um, so you know nowadays one of the buzzwords is IoT, and we were tasked with doing a demo showing how would you do application delivery um, in an IoT use case. So here's kind of the kind of the overview with the different the different teams, and what uh, just as microservices make things, um, they make things easier for development, but they come at a cost where you have to glue things together. There's more coordination or orchestration that's required. Um, I would say something similar with IoT, which is now you have three, at least three different pieces. Um, so the way we, we did this, um, we had, 
we had an embedded software team. So we modeled that as a Raspberry Pi. Um, so a Raspberry Pi that has a Blink 1, um, which is basically an LED light that's connected to the internet as our, you know, as our device. Um, we had, so this is a marketing slide, I apologize, you know, IoT big data. Um, this is just like the back end, right? So um, how, where is your data stored? Um, how are kind of web users going to access it? Um, and finally, we had a, we had a piece with um, kind of the mobile phone or mobile applications that I won't really show kind of in this talk, but it, the idea would be that because these IoT sensors sometimes, don't, you may be away from the IoT device, um, it's very common that you use a mobile phone to keep track of, hey, what's going on um, for, uh, with my device? Um, and the thing is you would, so these are typically three separate teams. What does it mean to do a deployment that spans all three of these? Um, so here's, let's build this slide out. Um, here's how we, we thought of it and modeled it. And, and obviously these are screenshots and these, this is like a very electric cloud like uh, focused or, or like an electric cloud slide. But I think it's, it's general purpose enough that um, you can use your tool of choice and kind of achieve the same thing. Um, so we were thinking that, you know, the embedded, okay, so each team has its own pipeline, um, you know, from committing from source all the way to kind of publishing to an artifact repository or app store. And um, let's see. So, okay, so they have, they have their three pipelines and at the end you bring them together and you stage it and then you, 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 de you deploy it to production. Um, and I ripped this out of a, a longer demo that was definitely a little bit more product focused. So um, I'm not gonna go into, uh, yeah, I'm not up here to sort of talk about my product. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna veer now a little bit up into how did we set up the demo environment as opposed to, hey, this is a really cool demo that you can do using our software. Um, oh, I, yeah. So, Raspberry Pi, <laughs> dashing dashboard, and, and mobile app. Um, and I guess what, what I'll come to over here is when we had to make this demo, it became really clear that this last part, this bottom piece about the big data, soft, big data software, right? Um, in order for us to meet our deadlines, um, we were going to have to use Docker, or we, Docker would help us you, meet our deadlines. Um, all right, so. <laughs> I'm, I'm guessing everyone has, has used Docker, is familiar. I have some slides for a review. Um, ev has everyone used Docker, if you wanna? Okay. Yeah, so, um, all right. So, you know, Docker, it's open source, used to wrap LXC, you know, then libcontainer, now run C. Um, the one thing that, it, a lot of people still actually don't know about Docker. Um, and the, the first thing that's kind of like a cute reaction, you know, um, it's, it's just how fast it is, you know? Um, so I guess that'll become less and less common as it, as it seems like everyone at least, you know, has a sticker on their laptop for Docker. Um, but now as every, more and more people actually start to run it, um, I'll have to like remove this line from my slide. So, you know, this is an overview, you know, the slide needs to be updated. It's no longer libcontainer, but um, a lot of times when I, a, a lot of times, there's confusion between Docker and Vagrant. And you know, way back in the day, I believe Docker actually used Vagrant in their repo, um, but they ripped it out because it was confusing people. Um, and for end users, that's still, you know, I talk about Docker and they say, I like Vagrant, what are you, you know, what's the difference? Um, so what runs where and how it's layered, um, I've found as being two strategies to sort of explain the benefits. Um, so just in this diagram, it's like, hey, all the core things that Docker uses is actually, you know, in the Linux kernel, but it is providing an interface on top of it. Um, and finally, the, you know, hey, why, why should I use containers? And so I, I'm mostly guessing that everyone in this room knows this, but um, this is how I would explain it to someone, to, yeah, to the people um, that asked me this question. So, you know, VMs share, uh, yeah, we have VMs on the left and then containers on the right, you know, sharing pieces of the kernel um, within the containers. Um, and that is one of the big reasons for the massive speed up. And then people, a lot of people, 
you know, they're like, oh, do you know, it's, it's faster. You know, what are the downsides, right? Like Docker can't just be better at in every single vector uh, or in every single measurement. So, you know, you do, um, because your host and your, your containers, they share the same kernel, there are some kind of, there's some implications to that. Um, mainly it manifests itself in security. And if you want more isolation, okay, then, you know, break things out into VMs. But, you know, the Docker team is hard at work at that. And I'm sure, so that's a, that may be a true statement today. Some people may dispute it, but going forward, I, I honestly don't know how true that, that will remain to be. So now that, you know, now that everyone's on the same page with Docker, you know, back to the use case. Um, so this is what we had to do. Um, we had to simulate, you know, the big data software team and the pieces we used were a dashing dashboard. So, you know, it's, it's open source. It's a really, it, um, I'll show it in a bit, but that's a small version of it. Um, database, we arbitrarily used, you know, we chose Redis. Um, and the back end piece, we, we used Ratpack, which is um, a Netty based Java framework library that allows you to, um, you know, to easily create kind of REST endpoints or, or list HTTP listeners. Um, so the, the software is on the right, the topology, the ideal topology is in the middle where there's, you know, we went on Amazon, we wanted a load balancer, we wanted different, um, different availability zones, and we wanted these different pieces. So it's, Right now, it's like without Docker or without a container, um, if in a week, if you had to do this, I would say, I don't know if I would be able to do it, to be honest, because we're using a lot of different technologies, um, Ruby, um, you know, Ruby, Redis, and Java. Um, so if you had to set that up in a development environment and then again in a production environment, um, Docker sort of makes that a non-issue, you know, so you can move a lot faster. Um, and so maybe I'm just, I'm stating the obvious, but um, for us, yeah, we just, we, we, cho we, we decided to use Docker and, and didn't really look back. Um, and the other, the other piece of the, so at this point, this is why we use Docker, right? Um, what I'm gonna say now is, hmm, I did a lot of other manual clicking um, and I wish I used Terraform and, and this is why. So um, there are a lot of communication paths um, actually, to be honest, what, what this is screaming for, so if you imagine deploying this piece of software, um, there's a lot of coordination and pieces or glue, or not glue, wiring that you need to do. Um, and if I had to take a second go at it, I think I may, um, I think the right answer may be a service registry, um, service discovery type model, but for, for what we did, um, no, we, you know, we instantiated something, got its, got its IP, wired it. Um, so I, I think that when you, uh, yeah, there, there's a, the, a price to be paid when you want to create it, um, these, these objects in Amazon uh, and you do it via the UI because now you have, you've done it once, it, um, you know, you iterate, it makes sense to do things manu manually once to get a feel for it, but then it's lost, you know? Uh, if you table the demo and go to something else um, and need to come back, you have to re-remember, you know, what, what the steps were. Um, so, you know, this is again, hey, these are the, you know, what are the IPs, um, how are things getting created? Um, so, we, we didn't, so as sort of, as I said before, we didn't use Terraform uh, or I didn't use Terraform and I sort of regretted it. I'm, I'm split half, half where this is my first time with a, um, my first time doing some of this stuff. So I didn't want to pay the price up front of, of using Terraform, but, um, but now everything I did was like, you know, was bespoke. And in fact, I, um, you know, what I did is I Terraformed it after, um, so I could reuse it in even more complex demos in the future. Um, and specifically, I've highlighted some of the pieces that I've lost um, that I set up in the, basically anything you set up via the Amazon UI, um, you lose <laughs> if, you, if you move away, you know, and have to come back to it. So it's, this is very demo specific. Um, I realize if, if people are doing kind of application development that's a little bit more steady, that this may not resonate, but for me, um, that, you know, this is sort of my life. Um, so yeah, and you know, I've, I've talked about talked about Docker. Um, so I'd say with, with these two pieces, um, I would, 
how I've done demos in the past, or I'd say even how, has, how the industry has done demos in the past to now, um, I think we're getting a lot better at um, having tools that can, I guess for lack of better words, fossilize, you know? Um, so if, I, if in a month another use case or another demo or another business, um, business meeting comes up and we need to show 90% of what I, what I showed, but a 10% sort of a new, a new take on it, you know? It's like, oh, okay, um, a lot of that work has been preserved, you know? And I can now focus my energy on the 10% deviation. So yeah, so now here's, here's a, my, my demo. Um, I put it in quotes because um, to really do the demo that the way I'd like, it would end up being a product pitch and I didn't really want to do that at this stage. So I'll just show um, a little bit about, oh, I see. Oh yes, yes, okay, I remember now. I think I brought it up, great. I have the source here, okay. So um, let's see, so I have, on time. Um, this is the dashing dashboard. So what I'm going to do real quick is just talk about, show a little bit of code and, and then show the demo. Um, this is our front end. And um, the, what we said was the IoT device would be a combination of the car temperature and the battery. So the use case is, you know, I'm driving, um, I park my Tesla or my electric car, or sorry, my Porsche, um, and I plug it in. And then the, the, the visual indication on the car is a, is a light that blinks, that goes like from, uh, from a green to a darker green. And um, as the, so while the car is charging, I don't want to be there uh, waiting, you know, for, for paint to dry essentially. Um, so there would be a mobile, this would be like a web app that I could see um, what, the, my, what my battery is at. Or we had, you know, we had a mobile device that looked at the same data. So in, in the back end, we so Rat Pack exposed REST APIs, talked to Redis. You know, this this data is stored in Redis, um, and the IoT device would would submit, hey, this is my battery status to um, to the back end. The front end also would query the this back uh, the the query the back end to display this data. Um, and the cool, I had a lot of fun with this because I put this this car temperature. Um, so I'll show you kind of. I, ideally, I would have actually also liked to have um, shown this, you know, brought this on the plane. Um, so Raspberry Pis are really fun, you know. Um, it's really hard to see, but that uh, circuit board has a temperature sensor, and with this setup, um, it reports every second. And I was sort of showing the temperature that's in my um, that's in my apartment, um, and I don't know. For me, it was. Um, I, you know, IoT buzzwords have always sort of, um, I don't know, bothered me, or I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> once, once I was, once I t did this from start to finish, I was, um, yeah, I was like, oh, okay, this is IoT. This is pretty cool, you know. Like, um, with the with the costs of everything, um, if I wanted this dashboard for myself on my own EC2 VM. Um, it would actually be pretty cheap, and I could actually start to monitor things in my home or you know thing, um, things in the car. Um, so I guess at this point I'll I'll start to walk through some pieces of code. Um, let's see. All right. So um, here is yeah. Okay, this is readable. Um, you know, here's just the real basic. Um, here, here's how you create an ELB, right? And there's nothing really, um, to be honest, not much to show here other than, hey, you can use cloud in it. So as I said before, we didn't, at the time of the demo, we didn't actually use Terraform. So this is me after the fact going ahead. Um, so we use cloud in it, which is pretty cool. Um, let's see, yeah, here's a cloud.yaml. So I, I'm referencing, so I, this is very much inspired by one of the air pair articles um, on, on Terraform. But you can kind of see that you know, the orchestration between um, kind of Terraform, AWS, and Docker, um, this is one place you can do it, which is inside of Cloud Init, and there, you know, there are pros and cons. Um, but anyway, for an example, the first one is the dashing dashboard, the second is Redis, the third is, um, is what I call the IoT backend, which is a Rat Pack server with a fat jar, you know, shoved inside of it. Um, and in terms of the, 
let's see, the code. Um, you know, you, so I, I'm kind of going, I, I feel like right now I'm going a little bit all over the place, but because um, I just showed you kind of cloud in it, but now I'm showing you Docker Compose, you know? Um, so what we ended up doing was um, for the demo, we did a Git checkout um, and we ran, we did a Docker Compose up. So this is actually pretty much exactly like their, um, I think Docker uses some Python um, application um, for, for their, in their docs for Docker Compose. But I was actually able to, you know, use that and um, use that fairly well for, for this purpose. Um, so, you know, you, you Docker Compose up, um, you're building the back end. So, you know, the Docker file is located next to this Compose file. Um, that was just because, you know, because I wanted to have kind of both pulling from the registry and building. Um, and, you know, this is grabbed from, from Redis, I mean, from the Docker registry. Um, all right, so I guess that's sort of my recap of, you know, how we use Docker and, and Terraform. Um, so, all right, this is kind of my few last slides. Um, you know, Docker, my, what I would say is I love Docker. They're doing a lot, a really good job. Um, there are some implications to using Docker, such as, you know, your, your disk usage will skyrocket and, um, it adds a lot of questions for uh, how, you know, now, now that everything's containerized, um, how do you put your fingers on it and trace it everywhere? Um, and, you know, and it's open source. So I would also, you know, so I, I also mentioned a lot of times that, hey, there was this AirPair article. Um, so there's this guy named Greg. He wrote this really great article. Um, and it, he goes into a lot more detail about like VPCs and a lot more AWS centric things. So if that, um, if that's your interest or if you're curious, I highly recommend that piece. Um, I'm, I'm unsure if, to be honest, I'm unsure if when I worked on this, if this was already out um, or, you know, in chronology, I'm, I'm unsure, but looking at it now, I'm like, oh, I wish, you know, this is super useful. Um, so, you know, so that's how we use Docker and Terraform. And then kind of like in conclusion, you know, um, super uh, it's cheesy, but um, I think it's a really exciting time to be in software where one person um, or smaller teams can get a lot more done because of these technologies that we have sort of standardized and agreed upon, um, you know, Vagrant Terraform Docker. Um, in the future, anytime that I do UI clicks, um, so I'm, I've been harping on Amazon and clicks, but actually even in my own product, I mean the product that I work on, we've also started to introduce a DSL. Um, so I've been, you know, I, I, I'm tempted to just turn off my UI and stay, um, you know, with the code editor and make sure that everything is DSL'd, checked in. Um, and maybe, you know, I'm sure that there is a point I shouldn't go overboard, but I don't know. Right now, that's just like, that's really how I feel. Um, and tight, you know, I already mentioned the organization and, and structure. Um, smaller teams can do more, I think, because of, um, because you have, yeah, you have organization and, and structure. Um, yeah, dr you know, drift is, is minimized because you're exercising things. Um, the one thing I would say, um, it, it's always, so, yeah, it's always tough. I, all of these software projects are doing a great job. Don't want to, you know, don't want to take anything away. Um, documentation could be improved, um, and it's. It, I feel like this is just a common thing <laughs> that you can say to commercial tools, or I, I, I don't know. I it's it's something I wish, you know, um, something I wish I could action on. Um, I would say, really, at what? Um, yeah. So again, the AirPair article. I would like. I wish that AirPair article was inside. Um, Terraform, e even though, you know, it's, it's using multiple, it, it's using Docker and VPCs and Amazon, but it's like, oh, I want to do something of that complexity, but when I go to the Terraform, when I, when I originally went to the Terraform docs, there was a gap. Um, but I think, to be honest, Terraform is, has also improved that. Um, they have like the two-tier example in their repo. Um, so, yeah, so that, you know, I hope that the three pieces um, and how we had business problems and, you know, how we adopted technologies um, was helpful. And, um, yeah, so I think that the timer says we have a minute left. 
Um, so I, I guess, is it okay if I ask for questions for a minute or we just, uh, no? Yeah, we got it. Wrap up? Okay. All right. Um, yeah, so thank you. Thank you, um, Hashi Corp, and thank you everyone for listening.